this is Janae checking in and you are now watching Black Mental Health Matters. So today for our episode of Black Mental Health Matters, we're excited to have Janae Johnson with us, who came all the way from Philly to talk to us about empowering young black women, her work with inner city children in Philly, and why it's so important for uh, young black women to be mentally tough in today's society. So thank you for coming all the way to see us. My pleasure. What I'm you did, you actually here. just came from where? I came from Baltimore, so I was at an event um, vending my book, Dear Teen Self, which is a book for teenage girls, um, with the organization, the Society for Girls. So, okay. yeah, I'm just kind of like making my way through Philly, Baltimore, now here in D.C. See you on World Tour. I it's know, good. I should go to Virginia next. I'm just sure. kidding. I'm going, I'm going to Philadelphia. I'm going back home. <laughs> It, it hurts, it hurts. But, you know, we have to have you here. Either <laughs> Thank way. you so much. First of all, let's get into your book. Talk yes. to us a little bit about that. What you read. Alrighty. Yeah. Isn't it cute? I mean, that's kind of like first step. Wasn't it? So you're a team? You're It's adorable. <laughs> um, so I wrote this book in 2005. And the reason I wrote this book was because I recognized that teenage girls were having a hard time navigating just some of the everyday stressors of being a girl mm -hmm. and of being a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I know that the work that I do is amazing, but I also know that I can't reach every girl out there because I'm stationed in Philly. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a tool and a guide that they can actually have themselves, that they can go back to refer to, mm -hmm. um, and something where it was just like their personal like therapy book. Um, if you will. And so that's where this came from. So give us a little bit about the true background. <laughs> oh, background. the teenage all background. Alright, so this all came to be because I didn't have my father in my life. He was he was inconsistent. I wouldn't say that he wasn't there, but he was just inconsistent. Would pop up this summer and call some birthdays, mm -hmm. not call some other birthdays. Um, and I really struggled with my mom emotionally, mm -hmm. especially when my stepdad came into the picture. Blended families are not easy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was free. I'm an only child, so I'm, my mom let me, me do that. Yeah. Yes, we see that energy we that felt, energy. right? Yeah. We were there. <laughs> um, and I was an only child, and my mom let me do not whatever I wanted to do, but I was responsible. But when my stepdad came around, I felt like so much changed in my life. It was like, oh, now you need rules, mm -hmm. you need structure. Mm -hmm. So I began to rebel. Um, I was hanging out with boys. I mean, most girls have boyfriends, but... Right. I was just probably taking it to an extreme. Mm -hmm. um, I dated an older guy mm -hmm. that was into the streets. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of young girls also tend to want to date the bad boy, mm -hmm. um, not really knowing what they're getting themselves into. Mm -hmm. I was an honor student, and my grades dropped from a 3.67 to a 0.8, to a 0.86. Yeah, <laughs> that's, an F. that's like I got a D. I got one D. <laughs> my sophomore year, uh, my sophomore one of my sophomore quarters, um, all F's and one D. There was just so many different things happening for me, kind of at once, and I just felt like I didn't have enough. I didn't know what the sleepless nights meant. I didn't know what the overwhelming feelings of sadness meant being sad, you know, for days at a time. Um, I loved cheerleading and one that same sophomore semester, I didn't make it to tryouts because I cut, I left school, I cut school, and then I didn't get back in time for tryouts and my coach told me no, and that like crushed me because that was like all I had, but then that's when I realized I was really spiraling out of control. Um, so yeah, I did a, I did a lot. Wow, wow. Some more in here, no, but um, no, no. I I did a lot, and I just kind of felt like through that pain, I wanted to I wanted to help mm -hmm. um, other girls. I didn't think that my mother and I relationship should have been the way that it was. Mm -hmm. So I just took the negative things, the things that hurt, and decided to put it into an education. Once I got my life together, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. that point eight six wasn't going to do me any justice. <laughs> Um, but once I decided just to kind of be on the right track, I was really able just to get my life together, put it into education, and now put it into practice. Okay, so how do you put it into practice now? Yeah, so um, in Philly, I have my private practice for teen girls. Okay. Well, teenagers, preteens, and I'm even starting to see a lot of young adults in college mm -hmm. that just transitioned from high school mm -hmm. into college. So what's that age record that's like, what are we talking like, 12 to... 
18? So that's my it? youngest client is nine. Okay. Um, because she was having some emotional issues and I would never turn away mm -hmm. um, a young person that's going through something. Because ironically, things that we used to think started happening when we were 14, mm -hmm. They're happening to kids mm -hmm. when, when they're 10. Mm -hmm. It's happening when they're 9. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, okay, let's get her in. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what's going on so mm -hmm. that this doesn't grow to be a bigger issue. So that she doesn't continue down this path. So for me, I actually like it because it's like I'm catching them really early to kind of nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. That's kind of part of what I do. Mm -hmm. I also have a nonprofit called The Black Brain Campaign. And I have a business partner. Her name is Farida Salim. And what we decided to do was come together so that we can eradicate the stigma of mental health in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. And one, we do that just by being two black women that mm -hmm. are actually therapists running this organization. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of support from, you know, council members and state representatives in Philly. Awesome. And so they help us put together events. They help sponsor events. They and they host them even in their community so that we can have conversations about mental health. Nice. And, um, yeah, so... That is cool. I'm so, kind of busy. <laughs> no, I see. Like, you know, like, well, um, with the inner city youth, Yes. why do you think that the African American community, um, in terms of inner city mm -hmm. communities, are yeah. so overlooked? What is with that? Oh, so, one thing that I notice is our children are experiencing trauma. Mm -hmm on a daily basis mm -hmm. so there are so many different things happening in their communities daily that it's hard for them to even catch a breath mm -hmm. of you know joy peace mm -hmm. you know we can say oh there's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. you or get over it mm -hmm. it's, it's it's hard to get over it in a happy way mm -hmm. they're getting over it but they're getting over it by being despondent mm -hmm. being sad mm -hmm. or joining in on whatever the mm -hmm issue is in the neighborhood. And not to um, cut you off, but what yeah. would you consider some of these factors to be? Uh, so one factor I would say is um, traumatic in a lot of young, in a lot of inner cities. Obviously there are deaths. Mm -hmm. There's people being robbed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of drug activity, whether the person is selling it or the person is using it. All of this is happening in their neighborhoods. So those are some of the things. Those are more of the things that I'm seeing in mm -hmm. kind of the neighborhoods that there's just a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's just a lot of sadness. So with you getting a hold of these preteens and teens early, what do you think the long-term impact of that is going to be instead of them actually waiting until way down the line? Right. So first things first, a teenager's brain is based on emotion. They think with emotion, period, where adults think with logic. So for them, they do a lot of things out of emotion. And we see them as being super moody and different things like that, but they're really looking for love. They're looking for attention. So me catching them early, I get to teach them how to navigate all of those emotions, how to navigate those impulsive decisions, how to stop and you know ask yourself three questions, especially if a teenager comes to me. Um, I work with a lot of kids or girls who cut and self-harm um, or send inappropriate pictures and videos and so we have to have a conversation around okay what's happening for you what happens when you send this picture do you feel happy are you getting the attention you want like what is going on for you excuse me and then I help them just kind of navigate those feelings and what's happening for them then and what the result is because I don't even think adults take the time to think about this, but we don't stop to say, hey, that's the result. That's what I want. But is this intervention going to get me there? Is this path really going to get me there? And then we don't say, all right, well, if I'm on this one path, if I'm not getting the result, when is it time for me to pivot? When is it time for me to try something new? And so that's what I do. I catch them early while they're in that phase of exploring before it's set in stone that this is how you do a, B, and C mm -hmm. to get this um, in a more negative way so that I can try to spin it mm -hmm. into a positive gotcha. and um, it helps. Sometimes they don't get it. Mm -hmm. All teenagers don't get it at the moment, mm -hmm. but I believe that I still plant seeds. That's cool. That's cool. So, yeah. so walk me through it. So if I'm your patient, we sit down. Walk me through step A, B, and C. Okay. I try to do this with everybody right. so I have a feel. So it's going to be it. it's gonna be interesting. So it'll happen something like I'll get a phone call, right, from mm -hmm. the mom. Oh, mm -hmm. my daughter. And I'm like, okay, well, let's schedule. And I'll schedule them. And then the daughter comes in and she sits on the couch. Typical. 
Yeah, because she's like, teenager. why am I here? She's a teenager, so I, I get it. You know, yeah. one, she's a teenager, so they are a movie, right? Whatever. Naturally, they have all these emotions. But two, you have a parent who is probably doing the right thing mm-hmm. and is wanting to help their child, but not having a conversation with the kid about coming to therapy mm-hmm. or why she wanted to bring her. Mm-hmm. So the kid naturally has an attitude, like, who is she? Mm-hmm. Like, how is she going to help mm-hmm. me with anything? And I'm just honest about that. So then they'll come in. I'm like, oh, hey, well, you know, just wanted to ask you how you're doing today. And, you know, we'll talk. And I'm like, did you know you were coming here? <laughs> and then they'll say, she told me in the car. And I'm like, oh, who's she? You know? And then we'll say, they're like, oh, mom. And then I'm like, oh, well, what did, you know, like, what else did she say about coming? Mm-hmm. And then they'll tell me if she said anything or, you know, it's like, well, she, you know, got a note from my teacher or something. Mm-hmm. And my teacher said I was doing this. So she felt like I needed to come in. And I was like, okay, well, what do you think? How do you feel? And then that's when it kind of um, takes a moment and breaks down a little because I'm stopping and say, okay, that's what mom said. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Mm-hmm. I don't think it was that big of a deal. I don't, you know. And then I just go into my spiel about, you know, informed consent, that I don't tell things, that this is completely confidential. They love that part. Yeah. Oh, you won't go tell. You not going to tell. I'm like, I'm only going to tell if you say you're going to harm yourself, others, you're being abused, you're abusing someone. And they just they just love that part. And I know when my teenager wants to tell me something because she my one of my girls will say, "Now you said you can't tell can't my tell mom this, right. right?" And I'm like, "Oh, the juice is coming." Because <laughs> she when she asks that, I know she's about to say something. And I said, "Well, what is it that I can't tell your mom about?" And then, or what is it that I have to tell mom about? And she'll say, "Well, if this, if this," I said, "So does any of does you know what you're about to tell me fall into that?" And she's like, "No." I'm like, "Well, then." She's like. Okay, yes. so they just they they love that part. That is cool. So if you had to sum it up, um, mm-hmm. you know, in two three sentences, why does so why is it so imperative for our young black queens to uh, seek mental health counseling? Okay, so if I had to sum it up in two you three, have to sum it. I know because I'm so long. <laughs> um, so it is important for our young black queens and our young kings, but you know our black queens especially to seek mental health treatment. And that's because there is there are so many different, you know, um, expectations placed on them from society, from parents, from teachers, from friends. I mean, there's just it's an exponential amount of pressure put on them. And sometimes they never have an opportunity to just be themselves, be in a room with themselves, figure out who they are, identify what they like, identify what they don't like, because when they're out in this world, you have this person saying do this, you have this person saying do that, this person, and they have to navigate all of those spaces. And they're a lot harder than the spaces that adults have to navigate because we've grown, we've learned what spaces we want to be in and what spaces we don't want to be in, where our youth, they don't have that option yet. They have to be in the spaces that we're putting them in. So it's important to make sure that they're getting the treatment when they're younger so that you can help them navigate the spaces early, learn who they are, learn what they want, learn what they don't want. That way they can have a chance at having a, I don't want to say a more successful life, but a healthier lifestyle where they're able to make healthier choices. But mental health and therapy is lifelong. Because you could be the healthiest person ever and you can just be going through something. And I would still suggest going to see a therapist, especially one that's cool like me. That's about five sentences, but that was good. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> no, that was awesome. No, 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 I mean, that, that was awesome. I, I appreciate I went to that. School to talk, no, but right? you got so it out. That's, like that's all that matters. You got it out. I felt it. Um, thank you so much for coming back. Came all the way from Philly to see us. Exciting! Thank that's you. Fun. Thank you for having that's me. Fun. That's fun. Yes. Way to uh, Letitia. Hi, so, so. Um, Hi, girl. And uh, we'll see you soon. Website, and you can find me on Instagram at Dear Teen Self and Facebook as well.